right, Philip, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I just hit record to begin our sessions, and I'll explain that to our guests today and everyone watching and listening in the future. So here we go. Welcome back, everybody. Clearwater Jazz Holiday's Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I am Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation CEO Steve Weinberger, and we've got a great panel joining us today on a topic we are calling, what are we calling it, Philip? Uh, everything you always wanted to know about music critics, but we're afraid to ask. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's... Mu music journalism matters 101. What musicians and everyone else should know about reviewers and reviewing. And I think that's a great work, a great title. And we're so appreciative to have you help put this panel together. We've got you joining us today, as well as Ray Roa, who I'm going to introduce in just a second. Um, and uh, we have Kurt Loft with us and Howard Mandel. Hopefully he's going to pop in the session. I'm going to keep an eye out for him. I'm going to go ahead for those that are with us today to to put out a little message on the screen that talks about how we do these sessions. Everybody will notice that they're muted for the courtesy of the session. But if you have questions, we'd love for you to participate in this discussion and you can use the chat feature. I'll make sure to get those questions to our panelists today. And we can, we even have the opportunity to unmute you and have a dialogue with each other. So it means a lot that you're with us. And for those of you that have been following along with these Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions, we really appreciate it. After the live sessions, they're recorded and they're put into the um, what we call the studio at clearwaterjazz.com. And there's hundreds of sessions up now with our education resources at the studio and the Stop Time series with Frank Williams, the My Journey with Jazz program. Uh, we hope that you're finding good value in these. They've come at a really important time, particularly for music educators, band directors, and teachers who have been working really hard to figure out the new normal way of teaching. And this virtual content has been um, really, really well received. And we're inspired by that, inspired to do more. We've been able to include musicians and professionals from all over the country. And uh, today we're excited to have this very special topic. If there's a topic you're interested in, uh, please feel free to email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com and we'll try to line that up. We want to thank our sponsors, Blue Water Wealth Management at Steward Partners and Duke Energy for presenting the studio and the Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions podcast is available wherever you stream your podcast. That's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. I'm going to turn it over to Philip Booth, who's going to help lead the discussion today. Um, and But before I introduce Philip formally, I want to say, what's up, Ray Roa? How you doing? I'm great. How's it? We're good, Ray. Uh, Ray. Ray started freelancing for Creative Loafing in January of 2011, and he was hired as a music editor in August of 2016. He became editor-in-chief in August 2019. Past work can be seen at Suburban Apologist, Tampa Bay Times, Consequence of Sound, and The Daily Beast. And Philip Booth. Philip, can you hear me okay, Philip? Yep. Okay. I'm clear. It looks like we got Ray. Ray kind of froze up on the screen, so hopefully we'll. Ray, can you hear me? Okay. So Ray may need to may need to sign back in. Um, if he can't hear me, I'll give him a text in a second. But um, I'm going to introduce Philip and let Philip talk a little bit, and then and Philip can introduce. Um, uh, Kurt as well. So Philip is a music arts journalist and bass player based here in Tampa. He was formerly the pop music critic for the Tampa Tribune, regularly contributes to Jazz Times, Jazz Is, and Relix, and occasionally blogs at jazzlands.com. He's written on music, film, and books for many publications, including Downbeat, Billboard, Variety, The Washington Post, Rolling Stone, Spin, and many others, St. Petersburg Times, Boston Globe, the list goes on and on and has also uh, participated in several academic journals. He co-leads the long-running band Acme Jazz Garage, 
whose debut CD aired on about 35 jazz radio stations around the country. Their second album is slated for release later this year, and we recently welcomed the Acme Jazz Garage as part of our Clearwater Jazz Holiday Wanderlust music series for a sold-out, open-air, and socially distanced beautiful evening. We really appreciated uh, Philip and the band for being with us. And Philip also briefly worked as a jazz announcer for WUSF FM. He has an MA in English creative writing from USF and a BA in history from the University of Florida. And oh, I got to unmute Ray, who's back with us here, so Ray can talk with us. And um, uh, I'll, I'll look for Howard to see if Howard can join us. But Philip, I'd appreciate it if you could also introduce Kurt, who's with us today, because I think we'd love to hear some of his perspectives on the topics. So uh, what I'm going to do is turn it over to you. And for every, all the panelists today, thank you so much for being a special part of this. Thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, yeah, Kurt uh, Loft is also with us. Kurt is a classical music uh, writer who uh, was with the Tampa Tribune, my colleague. He was there for many more years than I was. And, uh, you know, while at the Tribune, uh, he, he wrote about food as well. He wrote about science. He covered space. But he's uh, very knowledgeable uh, about classical music and about, uh, you know, music criticism in general. So I'm glad that he could... Uh, pop in today. He also continues, he writes, uh, you know, notes for uh, various uh, performing arts organizations, uh, program notes. So glad Kurt is along as well. And, um, and appreciate the Jazz Holiday for the foundation for all you guys do in terms of, uh, you know, reaching out to young people and uh, kind of, uh, you know, evangelizing jazz and music, I guess, in, in, in a manner of speaking. Uh, which, you know, if we talk about music journalism, music criticism, that, that's really kind of what we do as well. Um, spread the word about music uh, and, and, and uh, try to let folks know about what's out there. So, you know, I think we probably, this audience will include a lot of younger folks uh, who I think we're wanting to sort of check into what music journalism, music criticism is about. So I'm just going to say, you know, kind, kind of a few things about that. Um, uh, you know, what's something somebody just said today, a uh, guy named Bob Weinberg, who's uh, the record, he's a CD reviews, or what do we call them now, albums, uh, music reviews editor for Jazz's Magazine, which is a Florida publication, by the way, uh, started in the late, in the, about 1983, 84. I was there, actually, when it started. I was in some of the ground floor discussions, and uh, at the time, they decided to call it Jazz's Magazine. I, I was asked my opinion, and I that I wasn't that keen on it, but what did I know? It turned out to be a, you know, a long-running endeavor. But uh, but Bob said, you know, maybe we should retitle this. What's a music critic? Uh, you know, because some folks are just not really necessarily aware of, of what that's all about. So, talk a little bit about that. Uh, one quote that I thought was interesting. Uh, a lot of folks have heard this. Writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Different people have, have been said to have said that, for example, Elvis Costello and some others. And I guess the idea is, is really criticism is, you know, kind of an imperfect art at best, you know, using this imprecise tool to, to analyze a form of expression that, that ultimately means as many different things uh, to as many different people as hear any particular piece of art. Um, and, you know, it's not an always successful kind of effort when you're trying to summarize or examine using this imprecise tool of words, something that's created using a completely different kind of language. So sort of a caveat with what we do, you know, from the start that it's imperfect. I think another interesting quote that's kind of relevant is journalism is literature in a hurry, which is uh, something that Matthew Arnold, um, the British cultural uh, critic and poet said. And so I've thought about this a lot, particularly because of my background as well in creative writing, you know, is criticism as a form, is it closer to, to, uh, to news journalism, to, you know, reporting what happened and why and the impact, or is it something closer to creative writing? Uh, and it's, you know, ideally in the way I look at it, it can be kind, you know, it can be both really. Um, you know, many of us believe, uh, sort of 
have been in that world for a long time certainly think of it as an art form of its own separate from what you're examining um and uh you know some editors don't necessarily uh, appreciate that you know uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a time at the tampa tribune uh when when one of the editors uh, said something to me about my million dollar concert reviews and uh you know with what i tried to do with those reviews uh and other types of writing for other publications is always to have uh, you know on deadline of course it's all you know to have a kind of an angle and kind of as much as possible as quickly as possible put together a theme not just you know what happened and what they played and you know whether the crowd roared but you know to kind of put it in a unified piece and 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 also try to give it a you know a snappy or a catchy lead you know the first sentence trying to bring people into that piece as as, as much as possible um you know I, I would say some writers i mean some readers and some editors maybe think of, of music criticism and music journalism as kind of a consumer guide you know just tell me is it any good should i should i go and listen to it should i go buy it um and, and kind of you know what i think of as the mcnews effect mcnews was kind of a, a concept that people associated with us today usa today when it came out just really small chunks of information as the new kind of journalism but you know i've, I've seen how it's uh it's affected you know music magazines and, and sometimes uh general music coverage uh and thinking about you know rolling stone which for many years was sort of a standard bearer for pop kind of uh, pop music criticism and many things under that umbrella, uh, you know, to, you know, when I first was subscribing and reading it, there would be 20, 30, 40 reviews, frequently quite long. Um, and I picked up a, you know, magazine recently, Rolling Stone, it's now a monthly, not a bi-weekly, and there were maybe four full reviews, and then maybe five or six kind of mini reviews, very, very small reviews. So um so you know it's it's certainly evolved in in, in in a lot of respects uh and we can later talk about other forms where you do see long form kind of reviewing but um you know for talking about music criticism as an art form uh and and kurt would know about more about this but classical mu music criticism goes all the way back to european journals music journals back in the 1800s um, but when we kind of think about music criticism now, pop music, you know, jazz, blues, world music, anything under that umbrella, a, a lot of folks kind of look at it as really exploding sort of in the, in the mid 60s. Um, uh, really England sort of took place a little bit earlier there in England with the Melody Maker magazine. And I, you know, I didn't know this, but I just read that the first full-time rock critic at a daily newspaper was a guy named Jeffrey Cannon of The Guardian in London. Um, and a lot of folks talk about uh, music criticism really coming into its own and being kind of respected uh, as a form, you know, with the arrival of the Beatles and so many, you know, Sergeant Pepper and so many writers trying to talk about that and its impact on the culture. Um, and then, you know, big, major news magazines uh weekly magazines time and newsweek and life started giving serious treatment to that um so i guess sort of rooted in the late 60s early 70s um crawdaddy magazine cream where a guy named lester Bing, bangs you know kind of kind of rolled out his work a whole bunch of other influential critics that, through rolling stone of course um a guy named Robert Criscow at the Village Voice, who created Criscow's Record Guide, and at the uh, Paz and Jop Poll, uh, Robert Palmer at the New York Times, uh, Rail Marcus at Rolling Stone, and he wrote Mystery Train and a lot of very influential kind of pop music um, books, uh, music history books. And, uh, you know, lots of, of writers we could talk about whose work also appeared in many national national mags many of which came along later and blew up big something like spin which you know became a major publication there and then on the jazz side you know there are people like ralph j gleason he actually was a co-founder of rolling stone uh, but he wrote about jazz for everyone um, gary giddens was at the village voice 
for many years, 30 years. Uh, Whitney Balliott, when you think of sort of elegant, uh, insightful writing about jazz, he, he, he did that uh, for many years at the New Yorker. Um, and then, you know, currently, in terms of the big, if we're talking about jazz in particular, sort of the big three that are well distributed really would be Downbeat, and which has been around forever, uh, 80 years maybe, uh, and Jazz Times, and then Jazz Is. Um, so, um, so, you know, it's something I also refer to what Kurt had said, that it's good to make a distinction between the kind of music criticism that you might see in ac academic journals, uh, you know, which is lar which largely are read by academics and people uh, in that field teaching music, you know, that, that sort of thing, is to make a distinction between that and, and uh, you know, I guess we would call popular music criticism, the thing you can come and find at the newsstand. Um, and um, although I guess it has to be said that, you know, the level of readers, let's say you've been reading, somebody who's been reading Downbeat forever, they're certainly going to have a kind of musical sophistication in many cases that that's uh, going to allow you to write to kind of an elevated sort of uh, music intelligent person. But um, I, I guess, you know, this would be, a, you know, a question that, that um, you know, for Ray and, and Kurt, if uh, either of you guys, if you have any thoughts about kind of how music, how music journalism, music criticism broke through as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as an art form sort of unto itself and in that I'm, process. I'm happy to take a stab at that if, if you'd like, Phil. Um, and it sort of takes me back to the word criticus, which is Latin for to discuss. And when you think about that, that's the essence of what music criticism is for the purposes of our discussion today, is it's really a discussion with your readership. It's about a dialogue with the community. And when I uh, hear people who have somewhat of a, uh, a little bit of a narrow-minded narrow view about criticism in general, they think it's people that are out to destroy careers, which uh, has happened, but that's not the purpose of it. I, I firmly believe that all criticism inherently must be constructive. And I've had arguments with other critics about that, but there's no such thing as negative criticism. That's called complaining. Mm. Constructive criticism is about building a dialogue with the community. And it's about two other things. It's about informing people about the event and enlightening them about what the event meant or continues to mean. And we can discuss later in this discussion some of the scaffolding that goes into doing a review on deadline which i'm happy to share but uh but i, I wanted to emphasize early on that the criticism is inherently uh constructive because it's about supporting and building a community and and basically uh having a historical record of what happened that night uh that for that concert but but i just wanted to emphasize that as as far as how it started with papers because we we are sort of the cultural cops you have a cop reporter that goes out and covers a crash or a shooting we go out and cover an opera or a jazz uh, a set uh and we have to find a way to 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 basically put in writing on deadline what was there uh how it was there and what it meant in the end and I think that's the purpose and continues to be the purpose of uh, criticism in newspapers, what's left of newspapers. Um, but I won't go on on uh, where, where it is on television because I don't know if it even exists. Phil? Ray, Ray you wanted to jump in there, that's all. Yeah, I, I would second that. I, I won't wade in, into television as well. And um, it's interesting to hear you talk about uh, reading reviews in magazines, specifically Rolling Stone. Um, I definitely subscribe to Rolling Stone for a large part of my formative years. And um, I remember reading, like, I guess we could call them micro reviews compared to, you know, they would have some at length and then a lot of really short ones. Um, I came into uh, music journalism roughly 10 years ago. So we were already kind of in that phase where you are writing a lot of smaller reviews, but you were still doing reviews. I mean, my first assignments when I first started writing for Reacts, 
a music magazine back in the day uh, were to do two CD reviews every week. And um, I will agree with that assessment in that. I think it's a combo. I, I In the beginning, I never thought of, of myself as um, somebody trying to help the consumer make um, a good choice with their money. Um, I felt like um, more of a journalist or, uh, you know, capturing uh, the, the news of it for sure. Um, in the beginning, I always struggled um, with that idea that Kurt was talking about, um, about possibly damaging somebody's um, career or, um, you know, saying something negative about um, a, a work of art that was somebody's, especially that wasn't constructive. Um, because when you come up in the internet age, um, it's hard to find, it's getting harder and harder to find places where people aren't just complaining or, or saying something um, negative. So I think it is important to say things are um, constructive and going down that path, you know, you talked about, you know, Mick news and, and things like that. And it's so crazy to talk about concert reviews, by the way, right now, because yeah. I can't remember the last time I, where, uh, where are they? <laughs> yeah, I no was concert. on deadline. Um, and thinking about, I, I write my reviews in, in Google docs, um, as the concert's going on, I, I have my uh, notes in there and I do the same thing as you Philip. where I kind of have an idea of what I think I might see, um, just from previous research. And I maybe have a loose idea on what, a theme might be, um, that might make me prone to looking for it. Um, but once I'm there, I kind of latch on to things that, um, the artist does or says on stage. I definitely do enjoy the aspect of, um, trying to figure out how the crowd is receiving it. Um, you have to make a lot of assumptions about people that I'm not always comfortable with because as time goes on, you realize you were almost always wrong about the people that you were judging. Um, especially the audience, but I, I would do the same thing where I would try to um, come up with a theme and do that. Now, as far as um, criticizing somebody's music, we do that less. Going back to the McNews thing, as far as creative loafing, um, our newspaper is 33 years old. And I think um, over time, uh, the way we've covered the arts, specifically music has changed. Um, I know um, at a time when I'll just say Eric Snyder was here, one of uh, this paper's greatest uh, music critics and uh, people to talk to about music, specifically um, local, he would do album reviews um, for local bands. And um, sometimes they weren't afraid to uh, give constructive criticism um, for us as the volume of music has increased and and that's not uh, that's not to say it's, uh, you know, hearing loss type of volume, but uh, there's just so much music now being thrown um, at us. We haven't done a traditional album review starred um, in I don't know how long. And in fact, when a local artist emails me asking for a review, I kind of build it around. I try to build it around a live event. So in that sense, we will be doing the journalism about. Um, who the person is, some background and things like that. We will preview the show um, in the same breath. Um, and if we have the space, uh, we'll do our best to also write about um, the album and the music um, in a critical way. Sometimes that happens in those bites that you see in Music Week. For instance, I wrote about Acme Jazz Garage playing uh, Ella's on Sunday. Oh, I actually didn't is. see that yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's live yet, but uh, it's in the print. Um, it's in the print issue tomorrow, but it is like a snack size. And, um, you know, our motivation there is to say there's just a tiny bit of updating. I mentioned Timpano and how that's up in the air, you know, so that's me trying to say, hey, this is what I know about Timpano and specifically Acme Jazz Garage and its residency there. Here's where you can see them now. And then I have to kind of walk away from that just because of what's happened to our publication, how many people are left, uh, the time we <laughs> yeah. have left, and then I kind of move back. So um, too long, don't read. Our publication has definitely evolved in the way it criticizes music. We do um, less long form criticism and more trying to capture 
um, the temperature and the state of the local music scene in the context of the concert calendar. Um, and, and that's how we do it now. For now, I don't see that changing much unless something happens where we hire. It's absurd that I was hired to write about music here uh, at this point now that I'm thinking about it. I, ultimate dream job, um, but I just don't see how we would hire anybody to be an editor specifically in any vertical at this point because um, yeah yeah person a lot one thing that uh, you know and when you talked about you know the little the blurbs i guess just small items that you write about local bands that that's you know even though it feels like it's small and maybe you think oh it'll just be a throwaway or something certainly local artists always appreciate any shining of the light on on their endeavors because sometimes you know, as a local musician, you feel like you're out there struggling. Nobody's noticing. But uh, I did one thing you did interest, interest me, and in, uh, you know, you talked about um, using Google Docs to to write a review. And and so it's interesting how technology has changed that. And I know that Kurt remembers this: the days when you know, I think about the days when I, <laughs> I don't know how many years ago now that I I went to the Orlando, maybe it was called the Orlando Arena at that point, or those. I don't know what it was called, but to review a Peter Gabriel show. And, you know, we, we were on these TRS 80s. Uh, you put the cup from the laptop to the phone, you click a button, and then it starts transmitting. And you hope that the transmission doesn't break up before all the data is sent. Um, I know that you remember oh, yeah. those not fun days. <laughs> Hey, Phil, Ray, if I may interrupt, um, Ray said something that I think is worth bringing and, up. And, you know, you know, and then those days, too. So, so it's, it's, that's a nice, uh, yeah. I think we're using I think, a little. I think I lost the connection. Can, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think uh, Philip, Philip seemed like he was a little bit behind us. Um, so we'll see if he mm -hmm. Philip, can you hear us okay? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, You're back. I was, okay. I was just going to mention something if I can interrupt. Ray said he used the word review uh, uh, as opposed to uh, preview. And I think that's something that we should all discuss for a few minutes because when I was at the paper uh, for 27 years, one of the constant discussions we had was what is more important, the review, which is the after, of, after the fact document, or the preview, which informs people about what is about to happen, not what did happen. How do you guys feel about that? Because I think both are essential parts of criticism. I personally don't feel like you can have one without the other, especially if it's a big um, national artist. I think the cycle demands, at least our website, demands that you write the news and you do the preview with as much information that's available when the news is announced, for instance, a concert announcement. And if it's a big artist, you continue to follow that development um, until the show comes. And um, as you said, I still think it's important to tell people what happened at, at the concert, um, especially if you still believe that every concert is different and, um, and that uh, there are little nuances in every market and performance that are, are worth highlighting um, to make people feel like what happened um, in their town is, is, is special. So I think you still have to have both. Um, and I think yeah, it's fun I've, to do both. Yeah, I've, you know, I've always, I mean, just in terms of sort of an, as we're talking about, like an art in itself, and unto itself, I mean, I think reviewing a performance has its own, you know, own merits. and. Um, the people in your, if you're talking about a local newspaper, uh, local market, I mean, I think the ones who care about music still want to see something like that. It, you know, I was there and, and they can sort of like experience it again in a way. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you know, but, but then again, sometimes it's a function of, of manpower, of, of person power, you know, people of staff power, you know. Um, if you've only got one person to do it, you know, there's only so much of you to go around. So, I, uh, you know, I think if you had, I, I'm not really, 
don't like the idea of choosing, but I, I think you should cover what's coming into town as, as much as you can. Let folks know about what's about to happen as, as much as you can and review to the degree that you have folks available to cover it. Um, now, so. Kurt, I will say to your, to your point, it is, it would be rare for us to vote, to devote like a full page preview mm -hmm. and then a full page page review just sure. because of the constraints of time. So we would pick um, one to lean on uh, more heavily. Um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, where the artist is in this in that particular time in history and their availability and then the availability. And, and yeah. then there's, then there's the gray area where the artist and their marketing people want you to preview in order to sell tickets, but that's not your goal. You're not there to sell tickets, but that's part of the relationship we have in the arts is you sort of have to find that gray area and figure out how to work within it. I can't tell you how many people I never thought I'd get to talk to until the ticket sales weren't great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely, you know, at the Friday Extra at the Tampa Tribune, I, I did, you know, get to the point where I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm just this cog, <laughs> you know, in this machine used to sell a show at the, at the Sundome or, the, you know, other arenas or uh, whatever the big venues are in your market. This would apply to any market. But, and, you know, that, that is just one of the demands of, of a commercial product that you're working for, a, a newspaper. Um, Phil, Phil I, I don't know if you remember this, but Friday Extra, you mentioned it. Uh, I did a cover story on Wynton Marsalis, who came to Tampa back in the 90s. And halfway through the interview for the, for the cover story, he hung up the phone for some reason. And uh, I called him back and I said, we had an agreement that you were going to talk to me for a preview and you breached that agreement. <laughs> you called him back. <laughs> I was pissed off. So he reluctantly went through with the interview. I wrote the story just as it unfolded and said he hung up the phone, et cetera. But the point being is that he was jeopardizing his ticket sales by, by not wanting to go through with that, that call. And I had an obligation because I was on the deadline. I had to fill the space. But uh, you probably have more war stories than I'd ever want to know. Well, I mean, let's let's talk. I mean, that, that's one of the things I wanted to to uh, to bring up too among us. Uh, you know, interesting or dis disconcerting interview experiences are good ones. And a couple that come to mind is uh, one time I was somehow able to get Miles Davis on the phone. And um, we were talking about the Amandla album uh, that he did with Marcus Miller. And uh, part of one of the things about that album was it had what was called go-go beats, uh, sort of out of the D.C. area. And, and so we had barely gotten, gotten started. And, and I started to ask him about that area. And, and uh, he, you know, he goes, uh, you give me a call back. You want got something you want to talk about, or you know, he's just you know, and his horse Miles Davis. He's like he just didn't want to talk about it and hung up. So I, I didn't have a way of calling him back because I think I think his publicist had called me directly. But you know, and it ranges the gamut. I mean, I had a one time I interviewed Sting, um, and this uh, I had gotten to Sting through the door of Branford Marsalis. I'd gotten to know Branford Marsalis and interviewed him in Boston in person and, and some different, this is before he was really well known. Um, and uh, so he kind of hooked me up with, with Sting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be a 20 minute interview and Sting talked for like an hour and a half and I had so much content that I used it for my cover story for Branford for Jazz Is as a sidebar. And then I sold a story to the Boston Globe as a, as a feature on Sting. And, uh, and I, you know, and I sort of fits in with what people sometimes say about Sting in terms of loving to talk about himself, but, but it was purely a pleasant conversation where he acted interested in me and, and, and legitimately wanted to, you know, discuss what I thought were good areas of, of interest. Have you had some unusual things like that, Ray, in, uh, in terms of interviews and one way or the other? Um. Yeah, I mean, I will say it's always great when an artist is willing to give you the time. Um, so one of these instances that happened, I somehow was on the phone with Carlos Santana, and uh, which I never thought would happen. And I don't know if anybody of you have talked to him, but he's a really animated person. 
Um, at the time, it was a very, and I guess in, maybe in Santana's mind, things are always political. Um, and we got to talking about guns and uh, things, uh, something that he said um, about the way he talks about guns uh, on stage and uh, referring to fans that would ask him to just stick to music. And uh, he said something like, um, what do you think I am, your, your poodle? And um, I heard it a different way because we had been using poker language the whole interview. And, uh, and, and uh, I misquoted him uh, as saying a different word that he said. And he, uh, and, uh, he actually issued a correction via his social media the next day. <laughs> And I was like, well, I guess I'll never talk to uh, Santana again because, I mean, it was a pretty bad um, misquote and he was pretty heated um, and it made him kind of seem like he was saying something that he definitely didn't say. So, yeah, but that's really the only horror story. I mean, you definitely have those interviews like Kurt was talking about where you know the person um, doesn't want to be on the phone with you and that going back to what you're saying about being a cog, um, especially now, we kind of realize that artists a lot of times are asked to do things that, that maybe they don't want to do. Mm. And um, I don't know how fair it is to, to broach. And, and I get that there's this delicate relationship between the media and, and the artists, especially if you're on deadline, you preview a concert, but you know, I really try to be sensitive about what's happening in the artist's mind um, and what's going on with them uh, and try to have the best conversation as possible. Um, nowadays, artists probably get asked so many repeat questions. So um, I don't know. I mean, I don't have very many horror stories outside of, of, of that one. That's the one that sticks out. Most of my interviews have been pretty great, but they've also been mostly 20 minutes. Um, very rarely do I get to talk to somebody for 45 minutes or over an hour. So. Hey, I, I see that Mike Reagan is here, and uh, Mike and I were in the UF Jazz Band uh, many years ago. Great, he's a great trumpet player, and he's also somebody involved in the jazz industry as, 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 a, as a producer with, with films and just all, all sorts of things. He lives in Miami, so welcome, Mike. I don't know if I realized you were on board before. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to circle back around to, something we, we talked about, touched on a minute ago negative reviews and it's interesting as, as I think some of my you know there certainly can be some of the most fun types of reviews to, to write um, you know particularly if it's well just you know different different times they can they can be they can be fun to write and um, and I think some of my thinking about that changed really after I began putting out some of my music on my own. And I started thinking more about, you know, what goes into putting out an album project. You know, it can be, can be years, you know, um, of, of taking these songs and, and, and coming up with them, figuring them out with, with your bandmates, maybe putting them in the arrangements, figuring out how to get it, go to a studio and, and get a good recording and, you know the mixing process afterwards, and the mass, and this, some of this I'm in the middle of right now, and the mastering process, and trying to put the your best foot out in terms of the product, the design of the package, and, and so you know sometimes when you're reviewing, many times when we're reviewing a, a piece, a, a CD, a, an album, a musical release, you're 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 looking at something that maybe is five years of somebody's life, and and I I think you know there's. I feel a little more of a sense of responsibility now and not, and not taking it lightly, you know, um, not that I ever did, but not taking it in a cavalier, cavalier kind of uh, approach in terms of being negative. And the other thing about negative reviews that I sort of, I think I evolved over, over time was just sort of the conventions and the space that you have in, you know, I, I for a while, for a long time, I was I oversaw the CD reviews that we ran in front of the extra, and you know, so you have to make decisions about space. And it's like, do you want to give space to something that you're? Yeah, I think somebody, a book reviewer, wrote about this. You know, 
there's not a whole lot of point in beating up on an artist who nobody's heard of anyway. Um, so do you want to give a space, more space to, to letting folks know about something that you think is worth hearing about, even if you don't give it a four or five star review or whatever, or do you want to fill up the space with just, you know, sort of beating up on, on, on some, some artists for whatever reason. So I think I have, uh, evolved in that and i i tend to think that you know let's 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 give the space to uh you know in, in some ways evangelizing about good music pointing people pointing people to in the direction of of things that we view as quality content lack of another word hey, hey phil I, I think negative reviews are no more uh hurtful and impactful than in the realm of restaurant reviews because you're there, you're really getting into a mom and pop operation that a uh, negative review could really break, break them in half. Uh, unlike music or art, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing, you know, I kind of wanted to make sure that we acknowledge as, as, as much as we believe in music criticism and are passionate about it and, and music journalism, um, you know, when I, when I, when I got into the field, well, I was worked as a news journalist before I became a full-time music critic, but, uh, you know, in, in the late eighties, uh, there was a feeling that really the sky was a limit. Uh, if you did well at the paper you're working at, there were plenty of daily newspapers where you could, if you got in the door, you could work and make an okay living or better than okay as a full-time music critic or film critic or theater critic or visual arts critic. And, you know, I think we need to, uh, for those maybe who are not aware, uh, probably 95% of, of those arts, full-time arts writing jobs that existed 20 years ago uh, do not exist anymore. Very few daily newspapers have a full-time, you know, even, even a full-time arts critic. I mean, uh, there's a daily newspaper in, in our area that, that you know, that uh, where that person who was a critic there, uh, the, he's no longer in that position. He left maybe a year ago, I think, uh, and he's on a business beat and there, and, and nobody has replaced him. And then in part that has something to do with obviously the pandemic um, and the fact that there were no big shows to, to cover coming through town, but it's, you know, kind of like that, Death March has been going on for quite a long time. I, rem I remember for uh, for a while somebody and I can't remember if this was film critics they were tallying, but maybe it was film critics. But you know, every week they would you know post an update, and three or four or five more new critics had lost their jobs because they didn't exist anymore. So, uh, but you know, at the same time. Uh, even though that doesn't necessarily exist as a, as, a, as a career path, being a full-time arts critic, being a full-time music critic, is certainly something I think that we all, those who've been involved in it, feel passionate about and want to see continuing. And, you know, then let's shift it for a minute, uh, maybe towards sort of younger folks who are, who are, who are tuning in. Um, I think it's a way for you uh, as a musician to, to just – even increase your connections with a wider music community um, to bring your expertise as a musician uh, and as a, somebody who's, who listens to music that's passionate about it to, to somebody aside from your group of friends and, and maybe, you know, uh, be involved, have that potentially, you know, even on a part-time basis, have that as maybe, you know, another revenue stream in, in a way. Let's say you're, you're gigging is your main thing that you do, and maybe you teach lessons on the side. You, know, you can freelance. There are freelance opportunities out there um, to do that. So I uh, just wanted to make that note about where we are in the world of, of arts criticism, music criticism. It's certainly evolved. <laughs> um, so... Um, and I guess, you know, maybe let's talk about a little bit coming out of that, you know, where, and, and maybe, you know, Ray, you might be closer to this than, than us, where are the new spots that, it, that you see music criticism really uh, thriving? Uh, 
if they're not at daily newspapers, where are they? I mean, you know, they have been in blogs, uh, they have been in podcasts and stuff, but where, where do you see that? Do you see a certain trend happening among, let's say, people under 30? Uh, who, yeah, I mean, I, I would say the blogs that still write about music are great sources for finding um, new music. Um, it's interesting because I think playlists, streaming services, curated uh, by everybody. Uh, I, there's a playlist for every taste, obviously. Um, tons of magazines and blogs have their own playlists. Um, my favorite place to get uh, new music right now um, is Bandcamp. So <laughs> Bandcamp is a great mechanism where they do um, uh, music writing at different lengths um, on a really, really regular basis, and they cover a wide swath of genres, oftentimes eras, uh, whether it's reissue or a discovery of something or maybe something that just hit streaming from the 70s. And they have a large stable of, of writers. Um, I would assume they're all freelance. Um, it's almost like um, getting little bits of those 33 and a third books. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those, those are great publications. Yeah, the, the Bandcamp Twitter um, is one of the greatest gateways Ever. If Bandcamp Twitter could turn itself into a podcast and uh, and playlist product that I could just hit an app on, um, obviously they have an app, but they don't have that mechanism. I mean, I would do it in a heartbeat. It's my favorite music discovery um, tool, and and I think you're right. Even the blogs are are diminishing. Some of my favorite local music blogs don't exist hmm. anymore. Um, so yeah, that means that's. Uh, Speaking of Bandcamp, you know, I, I think there are, you know, some of the places where you go to hear music that are providers of, of music and, uh, you know, are also becoming sources of criticism. I mean, uh, criticism. Uh, Tidal, I noticed that Ben Ratliff, who's uh, for a long time was a uh, music critic at the New York Times, uh, was doing some, some essays and some, some criticism for Tidal. Um, and uh, I just made note here, you know, uh, Nate Shannon, who most recently had been at the New York Times as well, has done a lot of jazz writing, put out some jazz books. He, he's no longer with a publication, but he's um, with um, WBGO, the big uh, heavyweight uh, jazz station in the New York, New Jersey area. So he's like the director of editorial content, basically sort of serving as a one man jazz newsroom for for that company, for that radio station. Um, and I agree with you on Twitter. I, I, I find that that's a great source. You know, you figure out who you want to follow, if they have interests that, that you, you care about musical interests. Um, and they will, and the most active ones are frequently dropping links to new stuff, either to essays or to music. Um, uh, there's a guy named Ted Goya who, who put out a yeah. book recently called Music, a Subversive History. Um, and he also wrote one of the biggest history of jazz, uh, one of the biggest jazz histories a number of years ago. He puts a ton of stuff out on Twitter. It's a Ted G-I-O-I-A. Um, and he just launched a newsletter on, on this. And I really don't understand this format quite yet called Substack. But his, his newsletter is called Culture Notes of an Honest Broker. So you sign up for it. And again, he's kind of like a one-man uh, newsroom, a jazz and music newsroom. And you get the newsletters directly to your inbox. And then it also goes sort of archived in kind of a blog type uh, you know, format that you can access as well. Um, and so that's kind of a different it's, – it's almost – it's not, not micro blogging, but it's, it's sort of taking the reins in your own hands. And, and, uh, in some of the cases with Substack, some of these writers are actually doing well, making, you know, a pretty good income doing that. Um, blogs are out there. They're going to Mark Myers that does something called jazz Wax, six days a week. It has lots of really interesting information uh, and, and stories and ideas that, that just, you never really see anywhere else. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's evolving. What, Kurt? What is that like when sort of on the classical side of the, the spectrum, when you're trying to find criticism and things like that? Well, right now, uh, 
a lot of the work I'm doing is, is as I go back to what Ray and I talked about, is previews. I do, uh, for instance, the program notes for the Florida Orchestra, but I write them as stories that the lay person can understand, not these musicological treatises that you had 30 years ago. So a lot of the uh, the previewing is is really where the bulk of the stuff happens. The reviewing is is like very, very, it just doesn't exist in newspapers. There are blogs, of course, but uh, it, and, and nothing in TV. So I, I think it, it, all the classical stuff is almost all previewing. But, um, and with that, I, I was wondering, Phil, if we could spend a moment talking about something that I, I hope we have time to at least touch on it. And that's where we've sort of gotten into the soundbite, uh, thumbs up and thumbs down, which is not criticism at all. That's just basically saying go or don't go. And I was wondering if we could spend a moment talking about what constitutes the structure of a review. Sure. Would that be of interest? And yeah. I'll, just, I'll just summarize it. You guys can, can comment from there. I see a review for those people on the call who might be interested in doing reviews. How do you do it? It's not just your opinion. Uh, there are three elements that I think make up any review, whether it's jazz, rock, classical, it doesn't matter. And the first one is description. You have to go in and describe what you saw in that hall or that concert hall, whatever. How many people were there? What did things look like? Describe it. That's just a fundamental part of journalism. The second aspect is analysis. How was it put together? What did they do to make it work structurally? And then the last piece is called interpretation. How did it make you feel? Mm. And when you get description, analysis, and interpretation together in a review, you have a solid pyramid. And, and whatever you write, no matter what your opinion is, at least you got something you can stand on. I think those three principles are really important to have. Definitely. I mean, uh, you know, you, and as part of what you said, you want to try to present some context, context mm -hmm. as well. You know, where, where, where's Eridus been? Sure. Where does it seem like they think they're going? And some things you want to think about too, you know, they have a certain intent in what it is that they're trying to, often that they, they will, express that they have, you know, they're trying to do this kind of a thing or another. And and so one of the things is, did they, how, how well did they achieve what, what it seems like they at intended to achieve? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the emotional aspect is, is, is something that's left out sometimes too, but how, how did it make you feel? And, you know, people would sometimes talk about, you know, well, you're not being objective. And it's like, well, the point of a reviewer is to be subjective, to, to talk about how that experience impacted you kind of in that moment of time and then related to all those things that you, that you talked about as well. Um, yeah. Ray, what do, you, what do you think about? And uh, really interesting and the, to, to remind yourself that it isn't just about your experience and while it, you know reviewing something is inherently objective um, it's really on you to try to put yourself um, in the minds or the eyes or ears of, of folks who are there with you if you're in a gigantic room what's it like up you know there um, you know you mentioned uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, Jay Cridlin who's covering business now um, one of my favorite things that he does that I don't do is he starts a show um, down in the seats wherever they give us tickets an arena show and he finishes uh, the show in the press box because um, he's writing but also he can get a different um, vantage so um, I would agree with Kurt on a, a lot of the stuff the description and the journalism is really important and it's really the fun part that can kind of just warm you up and you know you know you have to do certain things uh, describe certain things I'm big on drop counts I love getting drop counts um, and the analysis I think is always the trickiest and, and most fun part and it's something that you only learn over time through doing previews and and reading reviews writing reviews and making mistakes in in, in your review um trying to analyze what somebody else is doing on stage especially if you're not a musician or have played any kind of instrument is tough um but that's where all that work you do in the previews whether you're interviewing um you know, the artists themselves or, or somebody on the on the outskirts of the when Paul Simon came through 
I knew I wasn't going to talk to Paul Simon. Um, so I interviewed um, a biographer um, who spent a lot of time with Paul Simon, and that's the best you can do. And that's mm-hmm. the only way you can analyze the show uh, from that point, because everything you think about Paul Simon is speculative. Um, so I think Kurt really hit it on the head. And I think one thing that's really important is to not get too hung up on after you submit it and be able to move on and, and do the next one. Just mm. learn your lessons, take your licks if you made a mistake and, uh, and just do better next time. If anybody wants to bone up on what we just talked about, there's a really good book out. I'm going to see if you can see it. It's called Criticizing the Critics. It's kind of old, but it really goes into what critics do what they don't do well, what they do do well, and what I just talked about with the three pillars, it's all in here. It's a pretty good book. I can send you the info later. And I will say, you know, Kurt mentioning that he writes the previews for the um, PFO um, as, as an outlet that tries to do its best to write about um, the Florida Orchestra when it can, um, having those resources for us and knowing they come from um, an expert is really helpful. I mean, it is truly like a hand-holding exercise from Kurt to us to say, here's what's happening, do what you got to do with it, and turn it into whatever you're going to turn it into. But the tools that come out of the um, Florida Orchestra, especially through this pandemic, um, as it's obviously experienced cuts have been invaluable. And as the orchestra comes back, the things that Kurt and Kelly uh, put out are definitely helpful from a, a, a music journalism standpoint. So. Um, Let me shift to, again, to the sort of the younger folks who may be younger musicians who may be listening and wondering about how they might get involved. Something you said, Ray, I mean, how important, I I mean, I would say that their own background as musicians would would certainly be um, an advantage uh, to understanding how the, the processes work and how you make music. How important is it that a reviewer, a critic, uh, has a musical background, either either knows some things about basic theory and or, you know, plays music often. Yeah. You know. I think I've always benefited from, I played in band in high school, uh, through middle school. I played pretty much every valve instrument uh, in, in junior high and, and in high school. And then I learned to get around the piano and guitar and I could navigate key changes and things like that. So, you know, certain things. Uh, if you buy enough stuff, uh, you know how certain gear works. If you interview enough people and hang around the soundboard enough, you learn a lot about that. Um, so I think it is important, but there is also that element of one, knowing too much and um, maybe <laughs> ending up doing a, a gear or technical review, which is great if that's what your publication does, but sometimes you can get bogged down in those details. But then there is also that advantage of not knowing everything because music um, and, and the live music experience a lot of times is something that is still one of the last real innocent things that you can move into. It's really based in emotion and how you feel. And sometimes the less you know, the less stuff there is uh, to get in the way of you expressing uh, what you've seen. Um, so there's a delicate balance. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. Um, Phil, I think one of the hardest yeah. things on what Ray just said, the hardest things for me when I was younger doing this business was writing about something like a symphony that was completely abstract. There was nothing to hold on to. It was just this big 30, 40 minute piece of music that, that nobody was talking or singing. And how do you go back to the office and write about that in a constructive way? And you do it through experience, but it, it's it's not easy, I must say. Yeah, and I think there are maybe some folks who, some writers who are steeped in that, who mm-hmm. might have a, be more comfortable with that. I'm the same way, really, with sort of avant-garde jazz. I, I, I appreciate, uh, well, and I'm not necessarily avant-garde, but sort of completely free jazz. Um, yeah which uh, you might even parallel with what jam bands do sometimes. But, um, you know, I appreciate a lot of that, but I've, I've, a couple times I think I was assigned or asked to review a, something that was a straight free CD. And I just decided I'm not going to do it because I didn't have a good feeling and understanding of what that was, what that was all about. And I, I think sometimes that's, uh, 
you know, that kind of kind of brings up a little bit of a different area, you know, when you're a critic and there's certain things that you really don't care about uh, or really feel like is just maybe not up to snuff in terms of what good music ought to be about uh, from your own biases or, or, or whatever. I, you know, you sometimes I think it's best to not even uh, review those types of things. Uh, I mean, you can certainly write about them, promote you know, as, as a feature, some, so-and-so is coming to town, this is what they do. But if you have a strong distaste for something, I think sometimes it's not really fair to that artist or necessarily to listeners to to rip on them. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, before we go too, too much farther, and, and I think we're coming up on an hour here, but um, one thing I just wanted to talk about uh, among us, you know, you know, how, when, how did you get into music journalism? What sparked your interest in actually starting, starting to do this? Um, and, and I'll let one of you guys, one of you guys start, start down the trail. But the, you, know. uh, you want, I mean, I'll, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, I was spending too much money at concerts and um, I also happened to be working um, at the newspaper at the school I was going to, HCC. And uh, my wife and I had a conversation, said I was uh, just spending too much out. So I was like, I got to find a way to get into shows for free. And um, that was it. And then I contacted an editor um, at React's uh, music magazine, which had gone online by then. Um, and like I said earlier, I was very lucky to meet somebody who wanted to support the thing that I was into. And they assigned me two record reviews every week. And I turned them in on time, on deadline. And then that was turned into interviews. And next thing I know, I'm uh, pitching Leilani Polk, who was the editor here at the time, trying to get a story. And that worked. And I'm doing previews in Creative Loafing. Um, I'm ready for Reacts. Um, and then I don't know how it happened, but I got on the phone with Jake Cridlin and he was uh, my editor at the times for five or so years. And that was it. I just kept doing it. And here I am about 10 years later, um, still here. So that was it for me. Well, for me, I was a, I was a student at the University of Florida School of Journalism, and I knew I'd get out someday and get a job at a newspaper, and I did not want to cover cops or school boards or politics. I wanted to write about what my, my personal hobby was, which was record collecting and classical music. And sure enough, uh, I got that encouragement from a couple of people, got a job at the Gainesville Sun, actually started doing that, and uh, writing about the passion to me was what kept me fueled and I did it for 30 years nonstop and never had any reservations about it. Yeah. And I think as the time goes on and you, and you do the job and, and you learn, you pick up these little things that the job requires that you never thought it would you either love it or you hate it. But I think I don't want to speak for Kurt, but you just grow to love it more and you just can't wait to wake up and continue to do that thing again and, and just get better at it. So um, it is, it is you know, a nice my, job. I'll follow up on, and so I had some parallels with what, what Kurt's experience was. Uh, I was at University of Florida, started writing for the uh, independent uh, Florida Alligator and did some music stuff and some film stuff. And uh, then I started, uh, I was able to write for the Gainesville Sun as, as, a, as a freelancer. Then pretty much right at the end of the time I was there, I got involved with Jazz's Magazine. I, I think there was a there was a flyer on the wall at the journalism building. I was not a journalism major. I was a liberal arts major in history. Uh, but uh, somehow I saw that. He said, we're starting, you know, want to be part of this new magazine. So I got involved with that. But, you know, I actually, uh, and then after a period of not having a job, a few months after graduation, um, I was able to get a newspaper job, just a news job at the news chief in Winter Haven. But it was really a couple of years later um, where I kind of made the, the decision that I really wanted to try to aim towards getting a full-time music critic job. Uh, and and I, I distinctly 
remember at the time I had actually gone to New York to NYU where I was for one summer a, a grad student in film studies. And I, I remember towards the end of that realizing that I just couldn't, could not stay because it was just incredibly expensive. Uh, but thinking, you know, I'm going to come back to Florida, you know, go back to the news chief, work my way up, try to get a job as a music critic. And, um, and so I did, and it took me a couple more papers to get to that position to the Tribune, 88, I guess. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, it was something that I was very passionate about. And so I finally did, finally did get there. And, you know, looking back, I was really only in that job at a newspaper for about eight and a half years, although I spent another decade freelancing as a music critic. But, you know, I, I always, when they talk about the Tribune, and this would go to newspapers in general, but having that job at a daily newspaper, I tell people it was the best job I ever had and the best job I will ever have. Um, to be able to do that full time, to cover concerts, to cover reviews, to, be, to, to direct most of what I wanted to write about, um, with some exceptions. Um, I worked for better companies. Newspaper companies are not particularly great companies in terms of how they treat employees. You say that about other companies too, but in terms of the actual job, it sort of seems like a dream job in, in retrospect. Um, and, you know, I guess I am kind of disappointed that that opportunity, that particular kind of profession is not, uh, does not really exist to, to a great degree. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll come back. But, but the the music journalism part, as, as we're talking about, will continue. The music criticism will continue uh, as with us and, and with, with others who are passionate about it. And uh, I think there remains a large audience that, that does want to know about music, does want to know what experienced listeners and reviewers think about particular uh, releases. Hey, Philip, I don't want to interrupt your 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 train of thought, but would this be an appropriate <laughs> time for me to uh, ask a question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, there are a number of, um, students that benefit from uh, our programs that are musicians that are working to develop their own brand. And that's a theme I see particularly with some of the, um, the college students, um, that benefit from some things from the learning experiences we have, um, this isn't really a journalism question, but it does involve write, uh, writing and communicating. Do you have any advice? Do I, any of you have any advice for these students as they do that? My, my hunch is that you have seen many electronic press kits or bios and the About Us section on websites. Uh, is there any advice that you have to students who are working to develop their brand about um, maybe some memorable things that you have seen other artists employ? um in communicating and writing about themselves and the media that the media that they're using to do that um i'll let you guys jump in if you well, I, I could tell you in one line don't write about yourself write about what the public cares about it's it's really not about the artist it is about what the artist provides that is of interest to the public that it should be your focus yeah, I was just going to say, I think, you know, when it comes to building your own brand, folks are on, on Twitter and, um, you know, on Facebook and Instagram and sort of the, the standard thing is that you want to, the people who follow you as you're building the brand, you want to give them good content. Uh, so, uh, Again, as, as Kurt said, it's not necessarily just about you. Let's say on your Twitter feed, you're pointing them to all kinds of good music. Uh, maybe you're maybe you're sharing information about even local bands that you're friends with. It's coming up and check out their new thing, as well as your own projects, of course. But I think that's that's a, a good way to to build a following and build a brand, be known as somebody who's uh, you know positive, who is sharing music that is interesting to their followers. So you know, that's, that's one approach. Yeah, and I don't know if I'm taking what Kurt is saying in the wrong context, but um, you know, he's right. And, and what Philip's saying in that participate, it's kind of the same thing with 
um, gigging and going to shows, right? Like you have to go to the shows to be a part of the thing that you want to be at. So as far as your brand and your voice, I think you should definitely be writing or tweeting or about other people besides um, yourself. But I will say as somebody who has to look at a, a calendar, um, it, it is helpful um, to have a good bio. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but it should have uh, basic facts, um, whether bulleted or in, in a narrative form, something about you. Um, when you do talk about yourself, uh, it should be clear, you know, things that you're working on. Um, I will applaud Acme Jazz Girls for being really good at, I know that if they have a new single out, I'm going to hear about it and I'm going to hear everything I need to hear about it. Um, so that when the time comes for me to um, write about it, I have a really good um, a starting point for that. So that's always really helpful uh, when I know what's current, what you're working on. And then even further than that, um, good pictures with photo credits. Yeah. Um, I still work at a print publication. So I resolution photos that uh, work well on newsprint that I can download someplace. Um, I love to run those on the top of my uh, music previews. Um, so those are all helpful and that's part of the EPK. Uh, photo credits are super important. I've been having some trouble um, with that. Links to music, um, streaming links, um, things like that. And um, as far as building a brand online, I think a lot about Jason Charos, who I don't know if, if uh, the Clearwater Jazz Holiday family, I'm sure you're very familiar with Jason and the Charos. Absolutely. Family, but, uh, I love following him on social media because he's always either writing, you know, playing something like uh, one of his assignments and talking about what's going on, whether or not he has to play this part of different key and what he's having trouble with. And then when he has a gig or a recital, he's kind of sharing that. Um, and when he's in town, uh, but he's also just being who he is and sharing the things that he's uh, excited about, which most often are other people, his bandmates, um, the assignment that he's been assigned or, um, you know, so um, just being excited. And, and I think that's right. I think you should always take the focus off yourself. No, I think that's great feedback. And the, the other question I had, and I'll turn it back over to Philip, is um, I thought when Kurt brought up the sort of the fundamental elements of what a review is, that was really good, particularly for folks that follow along with these sessions. So getting back to the theme of what this session is about, um, I got hung up a little bit on the analysis of trying to break down what exactly that means. Um, could you elaborate, could any of you elaborate a little bit more about what, what that part of a review actually means? It's just the, the analysis is the building blocks of, of how it was put together. Uh, for instance, I, I, I can only use the analogy of what I do with the, with the orchestra is, is the, the, the symphonic structure. You might want to, sh to describe the fact that it was in this form, this many movements, it used these variation, these themes as opposed to the interpretation and as opposed to the description. So it's kind of the, the hardware that goes into a review. Got it. Thank you. Kind of like, it's kind of like saying Bob Dylan going electric. I mean, that was a big deal. It was, you know, he put down the acoustic guitar, played an electric guitar. It's kind of like a, you know, the, there's a sort of the analytics of why it was different. No, that's great. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. It's a structure. Um, really not super technical stuff, but how it gets made, um, what yep. you noticed, things like that. Because once you build that, you can fill everything in around that and it gives you a safe place to live and, and do all the yeah. other things um, that are required of the review. What, what, um, what's in a sausage? Yeah, you have to, it's, it's a good exercise for yourself too, as a reviewer to, to always do that uh, because you have a home base. Although, as Ray said, sometimes you don't want to know exactly how the sausage was, was made because you want to leave a little, or, or necessarily try to explain that because you want to leave a little room for the, the emotion part, the, the, um, the transcendence that music can, the transcendent experience that music can be really at its, at its best, um, where it can take you, you know, beyond just the, how fast guitar players playing or something, just sort of a collective 
kind of feeling what's happening. So, you know, maybe, maybe as sort of a last thing we could talk about, let's, maybe we can talk about that. Is there, you know, is there a, a concert that experience that you, that you might point to as just really standing out and really, um, you know, making you feel like, well, this is, this is why I'm part of, part of this whole world. Is there anything you might point to? Recent, long time ago, really any time. You can jump there, Kurt, if you want. I don't have any one that stands out. I think it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a continuation. Yeah. Kind of like you say, you had the best job in the world and going to concerts and interviewing the people behind them and all. It's just a continual, it's very satisfying. I, I'd say it's just an ongoing experience. Yeah, oftentimes reading your own reviews is it's almost it's almost a selfish endeavor or job because you get to see where you were at in your life and, and the way something affected you. There's definitely shows that stand out in my mind. A lot of them have to kind of yeah, know, we just okay, there lost, he is. lost the last part there. Oh, um, so um it always happens to me at Gasparilla Music Festival when uh, the gospel choir starts. Uh, this will be my 10th year coming on and I am moved every single time. So I, I don't know what it is, uh, but I am almost brought to tears almost every time uh, during that. <laughs> kind of lost it there. The last. Um, it happens continually. It's it. Mm. Yeah, I think we lost that last part, but I'll just. Yeah. Yeah, I think we lost that last bit. <laughs> it for me, it just happens like every time uh, with with the people. It's usually the audience, the way yeah. they react, and uh, and the way I I just think about them after I file the review and, and go home and all that stuff so yeah and you say the gospel the gospel group that starts it i don't know if you've been to the jazz and heritage the jazz fest in new orleans but they have a tent that's the gospel i felt that and they just it's all day long in that one tent you know, quartets giant choirs just beautiful but i mean if i'm thinking back on a transcendent experience it would also be at the jazz and heritage festival at Jazz Fest in New Orleans, and I think about there was a group called the World Saxophone Quartet, and um, some years ago they put out an album called Metamorphosis, and it was with African drummers. So just four sax players and three African drummers, and boy, that this was at the Jazz Tent Jazz Fest, and just the sonority that the tones of, of those saxes coming together and then being just driven so hard by, by the drummers. It, it really felt like a transcendent experience, and that's—I mean, maybe that's one of the one of the reasons we keep on doing it because we want to repeat that experience or, or find that experience again. And uh, we're excited about sharing it you know, with others and, and helping other folks find their way to it. So. Any areas you guys would like to kind of hit on right before we kind of maybe wind things down? Um, I'll say that I am kind of bad at um, being kind of a doomy, gloomy kind of person when it comes to the outlook of, of journalism. I know sometimes when I talk about, oh, we don't have space to do reviews like we used to or things are changing, um, I'll say that the, the heart is still there. And at least at my newspaper, um, there's still a desire to be an active participant and cheerleader of the local scene. So while uh, you're out there pitching or writing or even pitching stories, while it may seem like newspapers are cutting back, um, there is still a, a need uh, for you to write music criticism, participate in that way. So just continue to do it. Um, I know it's not lucrative, but if you can't find a home for your story, write it on your own website, you know? Um, Although it may seem like people aren't reading criticism, I would say you should keep doing it, especially if you feel compelled to do it. We need more of that. And there's a whole great wide 
world of, of really music journalism out there. Some of the magazines we, we've talked about, there's lots of blogs out there to discover. The podcast world is continuing to increase. I think some folks are actually doing on YouTube. I've not really followed any of those, but um, there's certainly lots of, of, of places where you can find find it practiced and, and, and done well. So. No, that's great. Is Philip? Is this a pretty good place to stop? Wind down? I think so. Unless uh, anybody out there had any other questions, or unless you have any other uh, thoughts for us to pursue, Steve. You know, I don't see any in the chat, um, but Philip, Kurt, and Ray uh, means a lot to us that you uh, participated in this session today. I think it's a really neat session for us to add to the studio, and I know it's going to get a lot of attention. Uh, we, we've been doing so many of these that we're a little backlogged in editing them and getting up, but I think in a couple of weeks time, we'll have this one up and we'll be able to share it on our channels. So thank you very much. Um, and Kurt, it was a really nice surprise to have you with us today and, um, turned out that you were a really important part of the discussion. Thanks. So, well, so thank I, you. Thank I, you so I much. I wouldn't mind continuing. I'd, I'm, I'd like to volunteer to, to mentor any of the young writers that you guys are dealing with. If they want any advice, any uh, any help, I'm, I'm I've got time. Happy to help you. Well, take that, him up on that. That is yeah. Wow. Yeah, and same for me. I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to provide any advice or conversation or. Things like, things like well, I, I think, um, you know, offline we can talk because I think um, uh, adding this as an element to what we've been building, this sort of treasure we've been building and having that, these things, we're really big on just making these, this information accessible to whoever wants it. And so um, I think that's, that's wonderful. And I, I definitely will take you up on that and be talking off, offline. And for everyone who's participated uh, live today, we also appreciate your time with us. And um, stay tuned to clearwaterjazz.com, the education and outreach section. We've got the great Mark Feynman joining us back tomorrow with a, a drum session on, let's see what he's doing tomorrow, is developing fluidity on the drum set. And we've got Brandon Robertson, a director of jazz down at Florida Gulf Coast University, back with us next week on Tuesday. And uh, the list goes on. We add sessions all the time. They're all free. They're all accessible, available to the public live, where you can watch and listen later. And um, to all the supporters and sponsors out there, thank you for helping to make this information accessible and free. Again, Blue Water Wealth Management at Steward Partners, Duke Energy, Marine Max, Clearwater, and all the other Clearwater Jazz Holiday supporters. And to all the students that are watching us and have been following along, uh, keep being creative, keep playing, keep sharing, keep inspiring. You're inspiring us to do more. And uh, we'll see everybody back real soon. Take care. Thank Thanks, you Steve. very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night.